experience. Um, as well as the main exhibition downstairs, we've also got Death Is It Your Right to Choose open today. And they're only here for another two weeks, so now is your chance if you haven't been yet. Uh, we've got one more event next week, which is a death fair, like a wedding fair, but for funerals. And uh, we've got a death cafe and um, workshops, talks, films, and even some contemporary dance. Um, they're all pay what you think events, so if you'd like to donate today, there's envelopes on your chairs and you can either hand them in to us at the door or there's a donations box by Death Is It Your Right To Choose. Um, it's being recorded today for YouTube, so it's live streamed and then um, it'll be available afterwards as well. So if anyone wants to ask questions that they don't want to be aired, just come and ask John at the end. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. So I just wanted to pass over to Dr. John Troyer from Centre of Death and Society, who has been an advisor on the exhibitions. And um, yeah, generally very supportive. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Appreciate you guys like sacrificing your time this weekend uh, to hear uh, me talk about uh, radical life extension and other things like that anyway. So welcome. Um, <clears throat> as Amber said, um, uh, my name is John Troyer and I'm the director of the Center for Death and Society at the University of Bath, which I'll get to in a second. And today what, we're gonna, what I'm going to be talking about um, is uh, kind of a broad overview of, of what has been described lots of different things but has come to the notion of, has really settled on a kind of radical life extension. I'll get into what that means, its history, some of the things, more contemporary, not historical, because uh, we could take this back to the ancient Greeks if we wanted to, but I'm not going to for the sake of brevity. So I'll talk, uh, I'll shoot for about 30, 35 minutes. That's probably going to mean 40, but I've got a clock, so I'll keep an eye on it. And I want to set aside time for questions if you've got them. If you have a really big question while I'm talking, you want me to clarify something, uh, please let me know. In my head, this all makes complete sense, but I'm going to guess a lot of you may or may not have encountered um, this material. Um, I have uh, both current and former students in the audience who will be the first to tell you he talks about things that make no sense all the time. So don't worry about that if um, you want a clarification about that. Okay. How many of you have seen the exhibitions here already, either downstairs or upstairs? Have it? Okay, good. Uh, check them out. I have to say, and just give a plug to both Amber and Lisa who are here. Um, and I was, an, I was an advisor on the program, however, I will say that as an advisor, if I felt that the exhibitions, the, Welk, or the, uh, the Bristol Museum had put together were not very good, I would be the first to say, um, but I will tell you they are very good. And I think the exhibition downstairs is excellent at the level of a kind of broad overview of both history, culture, politics around death and dying. Um, and the assisted dying exhibition that's next door is excellent, and it is a first. And there has not been something like that that's been done anywhere. And I think it has engaged the topic in a very provocative and interesting way uh, as a bit of a <clears throat> sort of a lead into what I will get to. I will actually mention assisted design in this talk because it comes up in radical life extension uh, discourse in politics. Um, and it's an interesting hook as it regards that. Okay. So like I said, I'm, I'm in the Center for Death and Society. Oh, let's see if the technology works. It should. Come on, guys. Here we go. No? No. Uh, see, I'm trying to talk about biotech, and it's already breaking. The technology's got a big failure. What? Oh, there we go. Oh, phew. OK. Huh. <clears throat> That's why I have a PhD. So um, the Center for Death and Society was started 10 years ago uh, at the University of Bath. And last summer was our 10-year anniversary. Uh, we look forward to another 10 years and more of research excellence around all topics on death, dying, um, and the dead body. I, I tend to work more on the dead body side of everything, which means that I, I look, have looked historically a lot of science and technology topics, bioethics, organ donation, politics, you name it, around the dead body. But if you work in death and dying, you end up working in all these topics. So we all work on definitions of death, the dying process, what is dying, how do you want to die, all kinds of things. Uh, we offer regular, um, semi-regular, I should put, uh, seminars at the University of Bath. We have a great mailing list that's free if you just email um, the center at cdas, cdas at bath.ac.uk. You can be added to that list. Um, our, every summer we have a conference. This June the conference is on the topic of survivors and survivorship. Uh, and it's going to be a very, I think, interesting collection, very provocative uh, topic around the idea of who is the survivor. Um, yeah, and I think our next 
in May we have a one-day seminar that'll be open to the public on uh, the global trafficking in human body parts and tissues, which I'm helping to organize. Anyway, so that's it. Now, as you can tell, I'm not from Bath. Um, I'm not from the southwest of England. I usually say you can tell from my accent I'm from Froome, but that's usually a joke that only goes over so well down here. Um, I'm actually I'm from the great state of Wisconsin, uh, in the, the, the northern part of the states, actually from a small town called Hudson, Wisconsin, which is right on the border here with Minnesota, uh, near the Twin Cities. Uh, and the thing I guess that most people want to know whenever they hear my talk, and this is a bit of a, a full, like a point of disclosure, but it's not crucial, uh, is that my father was a funeral director for about 30, 35 years in the States, of which never I already see the nods and I was like, oh yes, now it all makes sense. Now we get you, like we see what happened. Um, and the truth, the honest answer, the truth of the matter is, uh, my father's profession had very little to do with how I ended up doing what I do. If you can believe it, I'm not joking. Like there was, I had no intention of ever working in death in any stretch of the imagination, and that's just what grad school did. So that was just how I ended up landing where I did. Um, <clears throat> but I did grow up around death and dying. Um, com it was a completely normalized experience for my life, uh, and it was not until I was a teenager that I really figured out that the way I had grown up, literally around dead bodies, not in a kind of like, I'm running around the dead bodies, you know, kind of like that kind of thing, but just seeing dead bodies, seeing funerals, all kinds of things. It was not until I was older that I realized that was not normal. I just never occurred to me that that was not something that, that happened. Anyway, so people always want to ask, you know, so was there any kind of long-standing, like, psychic impact on you? Like, what's wrong with you? Clearly there must be if you grew up that way. And I don't think there is, but <clears throat> um, this is a photo of me from high school uh, when I was age 17. Uh, and it's not just that this is any photo, this is my high school yearbook photo. And what's important to know about this photo of me at age 17 is that this is completely without irony. Like, I'm being, to I'm being totally serious in this photo. I couldn't have been more serious in my whole life. Uh, anyway, so it was also dramatic, uh, as, you, as you might glean from this. Um, I run another project called the Death Reference Desk, uh, which is something I started with two librarians, Meg and Kim, uh, and we run it as a reference desk, so if you're ever interested in topics we talked about today, I recommend checking it out. Um, we make a point of answering questions, and we've gotten all kinds of questions, let me tell you. Um, everything you can imagine. Okay, so um, by way of trying to explain a bit about what we're going to talk about today, I thought I would just mention briefly. I mean, guys, it's great. This is such a big crowd. Like, really, Saturday afternoon, like, I couldn't be more impressed by everyone's coming here. i, I got to bring it, man. So um, in case you're curious, actually, how I got into this, and I'll just say this very briefly. Um, <clears throat> what happened was in grad school, I, I was actually in a, I have an interdisciplinary studies PhD, if you want the full title, Comparative Studies and Discourse in Society. It doesn't exist anyplace else except for my department. And <clears throat> I was in a class on early cinema, if you can believe it, like pre-World War II cinema and spectacle. And I came across, um, through a series of events, I won't go into fully, a an advertisement from 1902, I think this one is, 1902, 1903, for bisga embalming fluid. And bisga embalming fluid was created by an American uh, funeral director and embalm embalmer by the name of Carl Lewis Barnes. And Carl Lewis Barnes was in some ways the P.T. Barnum circus showman of his time. And what, what, what Carl Lewis Barnes would do <clears throat> is he would embalm bodies and put them on display to show how amazing his embalming fluid was. And so in this photo, in this advert right here, you have the Bisga man. And what you can't see is the small print under here that says, embalmed with Bisga embalming fluid three months ago. And so what Carl Lewis Barnes did is he took the Bisga man to trade shows and he'd set him up in the chair legs folded, holding an advert for Bisga embalming fluid just to show how advanced his embalming preservation skills were. Now what's further intriguing about this is this is a photo of the actual exhibition of the Bisga man. And so I became intrigued by this because it's a photo of an embalmed body and what that brought together was a really interesting merger of a, a 19th century, a profound 19th century techno technological advance which was photography with a late 19th, early 20th century advancement in preservation, which was embalming together in one place. And that was sort of the first time I'd seen that. And I was talking about it, and I was like, I think there might be something here. And then that is where this idea of preservation 
preservation of the dead, um, you could say it goes back even as far as the Egyptians, but this idea of a modern industrial process really starts to take hold. Um, and that is, that's important when we get to some of the stuff we'll be talking about in terms of radical life extension. Anyway, so that, that's just a little footnote on that. Um, I think it's important to talk about death today just for a second. And what I want to say about death today in, in a broad topic is that death today, in my estimation, I think really in some ways is a product of what happened in the 1970s. And one of the key books I can point you in this direction is Lynn Laughlin's book, The Craft of Dying, The Modern Face of Death. It comes out in 1978. And in the 1970s, there was a huge explosion of groups interested in death and dying, just an enormous number. In this country, there was a lot of work around hospice care, palliative care, particularly Cicely Saunders in London. That was all going across the Atlantic. In the States, there's an explosion of groups having big death events, big um, conferences, meetings. Um, there are groups that are uh, trying to, uh, death acceptance groups. There are groups trying to work on uh, the right to die. A lot of it is part of the environmental movement at that time, which is still early, but also, and I think historically overlooked, a key part of the women's movement in second wave feminism and the push for women to open up medical discourse around what is happening to women's bodies, the political struggles in those ways. And it all comes together in this massive, massive movement around the end of life. <clears throat> the 1970s, I want to suggest you all set the bar for where we are today. And in some ways, we're still having the same conversations we had in the 1970s. And I'll give you an example. So, so Lynn Laughlin publishes a book in 78, young sociologist, she's now retired. And what Lynn Laughlin did is she did a big observation, ethnographic work, survey of what was going on at that time. This is her first book. And this is one of the key quotes in the introduction. And I'll, I'll read this out loud because it's long. Uh, oh, hang on, but here we go. So what she says is, it seems likely that eventually humans will construct for themselves a new or at least altered death culture and organization, a new craft of dying, better able to contain the new experience. I believe, as do other sociological observers, that in the ferment of activity relative to death and dying during the last two decades in the United States, we have witnessed and are witnessing just such a reconstruction. Undoubtedly within this ferment, especially that emanating from the mass media, there are elements of fad and fashion, a thanatological chic, as it were, having approximately the same level of import as organic gardening and home canning among the rich. And certainly one can never underestimate the capacity of American public discourse to transform life and death matters into passing enthusiasms. But there is, I believe, more to this activity than simply one, um, simply one more example of impermanent trendiness in modern life. Americans, especially affluent, I put in white, middle-class Americans, have been in the process of creating new or at least altered ways of thinking, believing, feeling, and acting about death and dying because they have been confronting a new face of death. That's 1978, surveying the 70s. And what she says comes out of this and then she identifies a group that she simply calls, which I had up for a second, the Happy Death Movement. And she doesn't mean this as a pejorative. She means this very much as a group of people who are happily embracing death as a method of saying we should have more death acceptance. It's also a group she identifies at this time that is largely white, relatively affluent, both straight and counterculture in style. And what she's talking about is a mass movement of meetings, ways of talking about death that are sweeping the country that are echoed, I would suggest, even in today's contemporary right now, death cafe movement. And these are, this is a map of all the death cafes across America. We could have done one for America, for the UK too, but this is a map I had on hand. Uh, and they're very regional. If you've never gone to a death cafe, you go, you talk about death and dying. They're all kind of different sometimes. They're very open to lots of different ways of thinking about it. They can be very regional. In the Midwest, where I'm from, they tends to be about cake, coffee, cupcakes, things like that you'd have here. On the East Coast, apparently many of them, they go have Chinese food. And then they talk about having you know, death and dying, especially in New York. Anyway, um, what grows out of this, I think, for my interest is in, so what is kind of happening today? What is new? What is not so new? But what is taken on a new life? And that is sort of the, the point of what I wanted to talk about today, which would be Oh, it died. Look at that. That's what I get for not putting new batteries in. Uh, radical life extension. Radical life extension as a concept simply means the idea of, and without sending that you wanting to punch me in the face, radically extending the human lifespan beyond what we would conceive of as being a normal age range. Um, the average 
lifespan in 1900 for men and women, women always live to be slightly older than men, so women are always slightly older in this way, was around 40, 43, maybe 45. That was 1900. By 1999, the average age was about 78, 79. And so you can see over the course of a century how big a leap that has taken. And so what happened then in the mid to late 20th century was an idea that was brought forth by a number of different people. We'll get to a historical figure of this in a second. This idea of not just extending a lifespan through medical attention, access to uh, food, the ability to deal with medical problems that previously haven't been dealt with, all kinds of things, but to take all that and to push a lifespan to 200, 300, 500 years, maybe even become immortal. And that was the basic premise. The one thing we have to think about as we're talking about this today is this, is that it's one thing to say, I want to live to be 300 years old, but it's a very different thing to say, and I want to stop my aging process so that I'm not 300 years old physically, because that sounds terrible. I don't know what I mean, like, because all the radical life extension people, and I get it, like, I understand the argument, but if you can't retard or reduce or stop the physical aging process, there's really no point in living to be 500 years old. Right? Like, there's just not, in my mind. I'm willing to argue with anyone about that. If, like, you want to make the case for a 500-year-old, physically 500-year-old body, we can do that. I'm all for it. But there's a thing about we need to somehow figure out aging. And that's the basic premise of, well, what if you stop aging at 40 or 30 or 20, but live to be 500? That then becomes this idea of that seems to be more acceptable, but how do we do that? And the how becomes a big question. Um, this idea of radical life extension is very much a product of, um, uh, it's very much, and I'm going to be clear, it's very much a first world obsession in some ways, first world Western obsession. Uh, but it comes largely from the States in, um, in book form by a guy named Robert Ettinger, Bob Ettinger, who just died a few years ago in his book, um, The Prospect of Immortality, in 1962. And in 1962, Ettinger talks about uh, the idea of cryonics, and he opens what's called the Cryonics Institute, and the Cryonics Institute is in Michigan, and you can still go see it. That's the uh, it's a, a building there, and the basic premise of cryonics was that you would put the body, the physical human body, <clears throat> in a deep state of cryopreservation or cold storage, but after the person has died, because if you do it before they're dead, you've just murdered them. <laughs> so after they've died, you put them in cold uh, cryopreservation storage that then at a certain point in the future, we don't know when that is, but it's in the future, they will then be brought back to whatever world you're in. Okay, and that's the basic premise. That cr this is what cryopreservation would do. Um, Ettinger follows it up with another book from the 1970s which is where this really starts to take off. In the 1970s, you have right to die people, you have death acceptance people, you also have the emergence of the radical life extension people. It is a social and cultural milieu that has been difficult to replicate, although it has been with us since the 1970s. And in his second book, Man into Superman, The Startling Potential of Human Evolution and How to Be Part of It, um, is very much in all its sort of Nietzschean glory, really a take on this idea of man and Superman without, without any of Nietzsche's irony. So that, that's the thing, like it's completely unironic in what he's presenting it. And that really sets us on a trajectory that gets into this idea of, okay, if we know we've got the tools to theoretically preserve the human body, human lifespan into unseen, unknown territories, how are we gonna do it and who are the people who are going to take the ball and run with it. Well, there have been many. One of the key figures from this country is Aubrey de Grey, um, who is uh, chief of the SENS Foundation and a gerontologist and around the, the British media in different places. And the basic premise of SENS has been to figure out a way to, um, as part of the transhumanist movement, sometimes they're called post-human, transhuman, there's lots of different 
categories. The idea was we will figure out a way to solve aging either through cold storage or medicine or whatever it might be, but that aging is something that can be cured. If you solve aging, if you cure aging, you cure death. And that's become one of the ideas. If you can stop the aging process, you can effectively stop death as we know it, potentially. Now that's tricky because, of course, we humans like aging in as much as we understand it to give us wisdom. So on the one hand, aging is seen as being physically not great. On the other hand, in terms of experience, it's understood to be something that can be good. You have a life experience. If I knew it when I was 20 what I knew now, right, there are all kinds of things I would have done differently. I just told myself, it's not a big deal. I know you think it's a big deal. It's not a big deal. Like, trust me. Um, and DeGray has been one of those advocates of that. Um, and so it's clear there are lots of different approaches that have been taken. Um, one of the big ones, building on Ettinger's work, and this is different than Bob Ettinger, is a company in the States called Alcor, and this is a, what they call Life Extension Foundation. Now, Alcor is different than Robert Ettinger's work, and these are two groups that don't get along in any stretch of the imagination, don't like each other sometimes. And what Alcor has come up with is, again, this idea of a cold storage system that looks like this. And what they have is they have body preservation and they have what's called neuropreservation. Body preservation are the big tubes, uh, stainless steel columns. Neuropreservation are the little tubes. Does anyone want to guess what's in these? Yeah, just your brain. So, and the difference is cost. So the big tube will set you, set you back. Last time I checked, that's a couple hundred thousand American. Could be upwards of 500,000. The brain storage neuropreservation is only, I think it's still under 100,000 American, might be less. And again, the basic premise of Alcor, this is a mock-up of what it looks like. That's not a real body, so everyone's clear. The basic premise is that Alcor as a foundation will keep you preserved in its system and that whatever killed you or caused you to kill you, whatever caused you to die, be it aging or some kind of disease, uh, incurable disease, terminal cancer, let's say, whatever it might have been, at, uh, in the future, and again, you have to keep in mind, this is a time in space, a time, a place that's not yet known, we will then revive your body so that you can be cured of whatever caused you to die. And so the people who are investing in this, and this is an investment, you have different ways to pay for it, very much are, and this is very, Alcor is clear about this, it is a gamble, it is a bet with the future. That in the future, there will be a way to cure these things. And that's the basic premise. We don't have it now, we might. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that, and this is, we can't test this yet because we haven't been able to do it because there hasn't been the cure that's been discovered to bring everybody back who say they cancer is it's not clear yet at the human scale whether or not this kind of cryopreservation system would enable bringing someone back, if that makes any sense. So, so say you remove a person from the tube and you want to revive them, it's not entirely clear that you would, at the level even of your tissue cells, survive that kind of preservation, uh, regeneration, uh, sort of revival. Is everyone making clear to me? So that's not, it's speculative, but it's not tested. There have been smaller animals where things like this have been done, like cockroaches, but we are a bit more co complicated, but not that much more complicated in some ways than our friend the cockroach. Nonetheless, this has been something that hasn't been definitively produced, and there's a lot of back and forth about whether or not it would work or not work. That's besides the point that people want to do it, they're willing to wait and see if it can happen, okay? Um, now, everything was sort of sort of the same. There was Alcor. Um, I don't have him in here, but for a long time, uh, there was another guy uh, named uh, Ray Kurzweil, and Kurzweil wrote an important book related to this called The Singularity. And The Singularity is another approach in which basically Kurzweil, who now works for Google, and Google's, we're headed in just a second, um, the premise was that at some point in the future, we're getting to it more and more, humans and machines will fuse into a kind of 
new state of consciousness in which that will be how humans go on. We will, in, in one form, one possibility, give up our physical form and simply start to reside in a kind of uh, cloud-like meta-machine consciousness, or we will be so fused with this machine intelligence that it will become something that causes our bodies to either live longer or we pass our consciousness on to other humans or other things like that. So it, again, it's a speculative point, but that's more of the less bringing the body back, more we're going to use an external machine. All of this is sitting around. No one really knew what was going on. There wasn't a big player to enter it until two years ago when suddenly Larry Page, one of the co-founders of Google with Sergey Brin, Larry Page announced the formation of a new company called Calico. And Calico is simply shorthand for the California Life Company, backed by Google's, now Alphabet, but Google's money. Larry Page's, you know, billions. And Calico has explicitly set out as a subsidiary of Google to cure aging. And what Calico has done, and this is a great quote from Bill Maris, who's, heart, who's in charge of Google's venture capital fund, very powerful guy. And what Maris said is, Calico is my idea. I'm super proud of it. I, it came from a thesis I had that no one was studying aging at the genetic level. What is aging versus the disease we associate with aging? And so the basic premise of Calico is, and they've sort of distanced themselves from saying we want people to live forever, is they want to cure all disease. They want to cure all disease. Now, <clears throat> you have to keep in mind that if tomorrow, and public health doctors have looked at this, tomorrow if heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, cancer, heart disease, diabetes were cured, we might only really be looking at an extension of the normal human lifespan to about 90. Maybe. So even if you cure those dominant forms of uh, disease that cause a lot of people to die, you might not be expanding that lifespan that much. What you could be curing, or you could talk about dementia, other things. So at a certain point, you have to get to this level of aging and physical senescence or decrepitude. Um, this is not a new argument that's come forth either. Uh, and just to give you an idea of where this was 10 years ago, in 2004, uh, 2003, 2004, uh, President George W. Bush's administration, um, every president usually in some fashion or form has had a council on bioethics. And in 2004, President Bush's um, council on bioethics put out a new book, Beyond Therapy, Biotechnology, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And it was explicitly charged with looking at the future of how biotechnology will impact human lives. Now, this is, a, this is a very culturally curious report because it came from the Bush administration. And so it actually has this odd mix of very conservative social politics with really far-reaching science politics. So it's as if, it, it would be as if you take Stephen Hawking and put him on a panel with a very conservative, like, Daily Mail columnist. I mean, that's, that's the kind of, it, so it, it is a report that has a certain schizophrenia to it in terms of, like, what it's, it's trying to do. But we should always keep in mind what President Bush said about it. It'll help people like me understand how to come to grips with how medicine and science interface with the dignity of the issue of life and the dignity of life and the notion that life is, you know, that there is a creator. <laughs> so this was how President Bush understood what the committee was trying to do. Now, what you, what you, have, to, what you have to understand about this, one, I, I give President Bush credit for getting through the quote, um, but two, there is a long list of presidential commissions that look at this idea of death and aging. President Carter, Jimmy Carter, I think a much overlooked president in sort of US politics, in the 1970s, late 70s, he created the Presidential Commission on the Determination of Death. And that was one of the first presidential commissions to look at how do we define death now that we have things like life support machinery that are keeping people alive but not alive. What is this? And so that report established a record of presidents and world leaders, and this country's had it through different prime ministers, trying to determine what is death for the population, for the citizen. Who is allowed to die? Who is allowed to live? What are all these things? How do they have access to care? What are all these different political dynamics? Uh, and it continues to go on. Now, what was interesting when it came out, this is one of my favorite quotes about 
the um, the actual report was that beyond therapy examines a situation that can only arise in a society with too much time on its hands. But there's a certain truth in this, which is one of the reasons that this kind of uh, report or this way of thinking about a radical life extension comes about really in the first world, the Western developed world, is precisely because since people are living so much longer now, it's not that just people are bored, but there's not a question of daily survival. There's a luxury that comes with aging that is part of that. Whether it's a luxury or not, people may debate, right? At a certain point, you're like, this isn't a luxury, man. But the point is that the ability to extend life in the way that we have in the West has opened up these questions in ways that it just does not exist in a number of other countries. Well, it's just not the kinds of access to things we've got now. Um, one of the more interesting points in the, in the Beyond Therapy report opened up a number of key points. Um, and it was there sort of mirror a lot of the broader points about radical life extension. And one is they use the, the sort of the stretched rubber band model for life. And what they say is increasingly what we've got is we've got a rubber band, everyone's seen the rubber band here, that represents human lifespan as we know it today. Oh, strap that. That's uh, symbolic right there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and that increasingly what's happening is we're getting to a stretched rubber band that just keeps stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching until it just snaps, right? And actually, I did this talk one time about this, and I actually snapped the rubber band with someone who realized it was a massive health and safety issue, so I won't do it anymore. But the point is that we keep stretching it and stretching and stretching it until suddenly it just snaps, whatever it might be. That not so long ago, it was not uncommon, and you, you know this through the use of the word, for people to drop dead. It's not a term we hear very much anymore. You do hear it, and death is always sad, and it's good to talk to people about that, but it's, it's more likely you're not going to have a death that happens suddenly. In the same way in the past, something like cardiac arrest or whatever might, might have been what caused it. Increasingly more people are dying in hospitals. Increasingly people are dying after an extended period of decline. Um, the other thing that came out in this report, and this is where the, the social politics come, in, come into it, and I want to dovetail then into the exhibition that's here, is one of the things this report said was, if we have a population that suddenly can extend its lifespan, one, we risk losing control, because suddenly you won't have an authority that can say, your life or death is part of our legal system, so that's one. That's more speculative, perhaps dystopian science, sci-fi stuff. But it's correct, right? If you no longer have a threat of your punishment is we can take your life, which is really just the United States now <laughs> and other countries. But no, you get what I'm saying. Like, it's difficult to control a population that's like, I don't care. I got 300 years. Unless life in prison takes on a whole new meaning, which is you're imprisoned for 300 years in solitary. I, just, I, like, I get sweaty just thinking about that, like in a small, like, like that's your, you, you know what I mean? So there's ways that this can be flipped around, okay? Now that, that me is perhaps me being really dystopic, but nonetheless, that's not far fresh, right? Um, but if you lose control of the population, what do you do? Furthermore, it is clearly something that would create a situation where people would say, I've now lived for 300 years, 400 years, I've done everything I wanted to do and then some. I now want to die even though I don't have to die. And what we'll see is we'll see the push for a new kind of assisted dying. That suddenly the population is going to say, <clears throat> we've lived this long. We no longer want to live because we've done everything we want to do. We're now going to have an assisted death and there's nothing the state can do about that because that's just how long we've lived. And that was, and so in the Bush administration report came out, came out strongly against this notion, saying that dignity in life should be such that no one should ever want to take their life, but if you've got a person who's lived for this exponential number of years, it becomes harder to say, you haven't lived enough. <laughs> like if you live for 500 years, you might be like, it's hard to say you haven't seen enough, you know what I mean? Uh, or maybe if you're like, if the average is 500, but someone's lived for 100 years, you're like, oh, but you're only 100 years old, you know, like, 
you have another couple hundred ahead of you. You know, like you have some. So, so there's that dynamic. Um, there's another dynamic, and I think this is this is part of it, which is access to this kind of care. And the reason I wanted to talk about assisted dying in this way is I actually, one of the ways I think it's interesting to think about assisted dying debates is that access to medical care, but also uh, aging preservation, like life extension care today, not the futuristic stuff, the stuff we've got today, in some ways I want to suggest to you all, not totally, but in part is mirrored in assisted dying debates. In as much as lifespan has now divided in such a way that for the first time in a long time, there's a new study that just came out at the Brookings Institution, the top 10% of earners, males, are living on average about 14 years longer than the bottom 10% of males, both born in 1950. So if you're a male born in 1950, I'm saying this is in the States, in America. In America, born male, 1950, you will live on average 14 years longer than a male that is born in the lower 10% of the socioeconomic sphere. For women, born 1950, top 10%, about 13 years, lower 10%, uh, the difference of 13 years, pardon me, <laughs> live 13 years longer. Um, this is reflected, I want to suggest to you all, in a state like Oregon, which has an assisted dying law, which has been around the Death with Dignity Act since 1997. It's withstood all kinds of voter referendums and, and court review. It's often used as a gold standard. And the key part of the law there states that you must have a, a recognized terminal illness to die by a doctor. It's reviewed a couple different doctors, but it's the terminal illness part. So you have to have a terminal illness, whatever that might be, to use the law. It is not a coincidence, I think, that across the board, and you can look up the Death with Dignity Act statistics uh, they're published every year online and have been. The biggest group of users of this law are white males, upper, middle, and upper class with at least an advanced university degree. It's been a dominant male population, white, educated, middle class, and affluent with healthcare. The groups that have not used this law are all groups of color, if we can use that group, which is not fair to say, but nonetheless you get it, in any kind of lower socioeconomic group with anything like that. It has largely been a white middle class phenomenon. Now, if you make the case that's probably because Oregon is kind of a white middle class place, that's true. The Pacific Northwest is pretty white, pretty middle class. But nonetheless, that has not been something that's been picked up. And what, what's interesting to me to think about this is we get it, as we get a growing kind of activist end of life and there's a whole group of over 65s now who are really taking, I can never see the do not resuscitate tattoo. They're actively engaging in a kind of really politically aggressive, you will not resuscitate me when I die. Um, now, our irony of ironies or perversities, this tattoo probably wouldn't fly. So everyone's clear. Like if you rolled into an A&E with a tattoo like this, even though it seems pretty clear that's your intention, like it's difficult to imagine you didn't know that tattoo was put there. Nonetheless, most hospitals would probably say that's not an official legal declaration, so we can't follow it. I have seen a guy who actually got an entire living will tattooed on his leg that was witnessed and signed, and the tattoo is all on there. I don't know if that would fly. But nonetheless, we've got a group of older citizens that are now taking the idea of ending their lives much more aggressively by aggressive, I don't mean people are out in the streets doing it. But nonetheless, you know what I mean? Like it's become, it's become a political movement in that way. And that everything we're talking about in terms of radical life extension, I think is mirrored in what we've got now, but you can just see it being exacerbated. You can see that sort of expanding access all kinds of ways. And we don't know totally what that would be because this is speculative. But nonetheless, I think we've got situations today that open up the possibility for what that future could be like. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. What I'm saying is it's a shift in reality. And it's productive in how we think through what these things happen, how they happen. There's also a long history, very quickly I'll wrap up by saying, <clears throat> there's a long history of this idea of the relationship of the dead body with technology or the dying body. And so a lot of ways what we're talking about is not that new. Um, when Samuel Morris invented the um, telegraph line, he, the first thing the telegraph was used for using, you know, Morse code, tap, 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 was death notices. People were sending death notices all the time. 
talking about death on basically a virtual system, although it was across you know, electric wires. Um, photography became a key thing, particularly for taking the photos of um, particularly dead children, but anyone who was dead, because it might have been the only image that you would have had of that person. This has not stopped, this has continued, whether it's camera form, but absolutely continues in terms of um, people with phones taking photos all the time, right? It, it, we don't, what we don't do is we don't put them on display like they would have been done at that time. That, of course, is a growth from painting, but of course, what you've got here is a great representation of a shift in access for different economic groups. That's much more affordable than that. And you can make an argument there's a real interesting democratization of mourning by the use of photographic tools. Maybe, maybe not, but certainly more people can do it. Um, there's also at the growth, and I just threw this in here because it's one of my faves, of uh, what's called spirit photography. And in the 19th century, there was uh, early 20, late 19th, early 20th century, um, there were great photographers who figured out how to superimpose images. And what they said was, <laughs> what we have here is we have a photo but the spirits of the deceased will appear in the background because the camera machine can see a world our human eyes can't see. And people totally bought it. They're like, yes, the machine can see the world that we can't see. And so there are all kinds of dead people started showing up, usually deceased relatives. I kid you not, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Lincoln's ghost showed up in more family photos than you would ever imagine. So like famous people started showing up in those kinds of photos. Um, jumping, jumping ahead now into, like, into the, the years, an issue we face today is that we've done a lot in terms of online work around death and dying. And I can't tell you the number of for the last 10, 15 years now, really since the growth of the web the internet web use, like 1990, let's say 1995 when Netscape Navigator, for all those who remember the old web, uh, goes live, people were using it for death. <clears throat> um, it, in 1998, there was a great TV show called Grim, we well, there was a great TV show, if you can get your heads around this. There used to be a TV show on public television in America called The Internet or The Net Cafe. It was <laughs> it was a TV show about how people use this thing called the World Wide Web. So you would watch a TV show to watch people use their computers on the web. Just to give you an idea what that was like, because it was all new, right? And in this show, this show, they looked at websites around about death and dying from the 1990s. I'm only bringing this up to say, one, this topic has been around for a long time, but specifically with the web, two, all of these websites are long gone. We are losing an enormous number of points of mourning development, mourning technology, particularly if it's web-based, because it's not being stored. Or it's on a server, but no one has a password or we can't access it. And so we're in a really interesting period of where things are shifting in what we're able to remember. Um, this is a great book that came out, published on Amazon, that was the account of one man's life as he died using an old web chat forum called The Well, which is still around but not really accessible. And it gives you an idea that the only way they could publish these reprints of chats was in book form. It's actually on paper, or I suppose you could get an ebook. You know what I mean? But you have to read it. And I think it's actually kind of genius. But thank God they did it because a lot of this stuff is just being unplugged. Uh, at a certain point, we'll then of course ask, what happens when there are more dead Facebook users than living Facebook users? Randall Monroe from his blog, the What If blog, figured out that at a certain point based on current mortality rates, it's, it is conceivable that somewhere between 2040 and 2070, we might actually cross the threshold where there are more dead Facebook user accounts than living Facebook user accounts. The question with that then becomes, who owns the data? What happens to those accounts? Um, where do they go? And I won't, I won't belabor that too much. My big point on this, final big point, comes from Douglas Adams, greatest writer of all time, who just said, I've come up with a set of rules that describe our reactions to technologies. Number one, anything that is in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary, and is just a natural part of the way the world works. Number two, anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. 
Number three, anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. <laughs> <clears throat> and that one of the things we've got when we talk about radical life extension is that it is a merger of a number of very old ideas around human preservation, aging, death, and dying, but it is also the bringing together of many new ideas, and in some ways it is the new ideas that are causing us to have the biggest ethical debates today. And that is what I think is so interesting about the topic. All right, thank you very much. I mean, very, great crowd, thank you. Good for you there. Is your clock okay? Are there Sorry. any questions? Sorry. Um, one thing I thought you didn't touch on, which I wondered if there is any research going into at the moment, is about storing sort of consciousness or people's minds in, yes. say, like, in data form. Or so the, Kurt, the Kurzweil singularity kind of, yeah, I mean people, there are people, there are all kinds of people, and I've talked with researchers, I've been interviewed about this, they're looking at uh, approaches to storing your consciousness in some kind of machine, cloud, computer cloud, whatever it might be. There, there are researchers working on that right now. The short answer to your question is, as far as anyone knows, unless Google's like Google X R&D works has done this and not told the world, as far as we know, it's not been done, and the answer to why is it's really difficult. So trying to upload the complexity of our consciousness is such that it might be. I, would, I want to suggest you guys, if you, if you haven't watched the series Black Mirror by Charlie Brooker, I actually think he's come up with some of the greatest insights into human uh, use of data and the future of data, and he has a great episode called Be Right Back, about a wife whose husband dies and she goes through a series of sort of technical interventions to sort of bring him back as it were quote unquote and i actually think black mirror is going to become to have been seen as not just science fiction but a great predictor of <laughs> all kinds of things um so there are people working on it. the answer is it's just it's just we're not there yet with state data storage or what it would be the other issue is so say you brain Consciousness wouldn't be their brain, but like what, then there's a great question. What is consciousness? You know those kinds of things What do you do with it? <clears throat> That's number one Number two, what if it says why did you bring me back? I'm I was dead You know turn me off like unplug me. That's more of the sci-fi element, but it's true and like th like three if you get enough of these like kind of cloud consciousness consciousnesses together um, what kind of legal rights do they have? What if they start saying, I'm a person? I'm not just some conscious, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. So, and these are interesting things to think about right now because we're not there yet. And that's what I encourage people to do. Yeah. Yeah. No. Hi. Um, one of the things you didn't really talk about very much is, is the um, implications for quality of life. Um, you know, as you keep people, well, you I mean you, you said that a few people just dropping dead, yeah, uh, which implies that they're having a, a longer dying process yeah. from going to sort of full functioning to right. death. Um, have you got any sort of statistics on that, or any ideas as you know, if, if we do keep extending life up to three hundred years, are we going to have like the last two hundred years of poor quality of life? Oh, well, that the quality of life issue is the issue. Right, I mean, that's the issue. We can already make the case now that, that one of the, the issue we have today isn't so much life span, it's, it's quality of life. I mean, that, that really is the big issue. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm willing to argue about other things like about disease and things like that, but that quality of life issue is, is core. That's the riddle, because if you can't solve that, that quality of life point, you can extend, we can keep extending aging all we want, but we're just gonna extend the quality of life problems. And so that, that's the problem. I mean, that's the, uh, uh, the issue is that, sorry. The, the, the issue to me is that uh, there's a lot of medical advances in oh, right. keeping people alive for longer, but not necessarily um, with a high quality of life. I completely agree. And that was, that was one of the reasons that President Jimmy Carter created his commission, was to try to understand with this new stuff called life support, are we actually increasing quality of life? Uh, and it, Again, because this comes down to human subjective experience, some people will say it's not a great quality of life. You'll have others who'll say 
it is, you know what I mean? And so it, it, this is why I would suggest to you all as a way of, of thinking this through. You really want to make these wishes clear to your next of kin, like unbelievably clear. Make, write it down if you can. That's good, but make those things very clear. Remember, you can change your mind. <laughs> so it's not like you write it down and like, like, you know, what I thought when I was 20 might be very different than when I'm 60. I take that all to heart, but you want to make sure these things are clearly communicated. But the problem is that um, without some form of uh, legal, medically assisted dying, um, however well you might write your wishes down, you know, if my quality of life gets below a certain point, right. I would like it to be ended. Uh, you yeah. cannot say that, it cannot be action legally. Well, you can say it, you could say it, but whether or not it's done. Now there are, so in, in medicine care, and medical care the way it is, and so everyone's clear in this country, I don't know, is, I'm gonna guess this is a crowd that might be more well-versed on, on sort of the assisted dying politics and, and legal debates in this country. So it's clear in this country, assisted dying has not been approved by law. There is what are, what are called the guidelines for um, compassionate evaluation by the Crown Prosecution Service. So in this country, if someone uh, assists someone to die, uh, there is then automatically an evaluation by the Director of Public Prosecutions to see if there's anything that was done that was not done through compassion, at which point there could, could be some kind of um, uh, trial or, or some kind of a, a further evaluation that way. That's, that's the legal process. <clears throat> What's gone on in this country is you, you have effectively created a gray area. That's number one. And I say this as someone who's a taxpayer, but not a citizen. Um, which means I can't vote, so I feel like I can say whatever I want to. Um, and number two, <clears throat> there's been a reliance on what's called the double effect in medicine. And in medicine and bioethics, the double effect is simply the idea that you are administering, and this is a recognized, this is a recognized principle, I'm not, <laughs> I'm just making this up, what's called the double effect. You administer something like a morphine injection for palliative care for whatever the palliative care treatment, and that you then keep increasing the morphine so that ultimately the person then dies from the morphine. However, it's made clear that this is not being done to kill the person and the person's life, and the person's life. It's being done for palliative care to keep them comfortable. So that's that is that. And I'll be I'll be totally upfront with you. That is precisely how my dad's mom, um, my grandmother ended up dying in the States. They just increased the morphine till she was, till she died. And she, she's an individual, um, I didn't really talk about her too much, but she's an individual who actually did die one time, was brought back in the ER, had a massive heart attack, was brought back through paddles and the whole thing, um, and spent the next, I don't know how many years left, five, maybe it's five, 10 years, really angry about it. In fact, she said in the ER, like, why didn't you let me die, I was dead. Then not only did, why didn't you let me die? I was dead. I was dead, and I was going to see. I was going to see God. I was going to because she was a very devout Christian, very devout Christian. Um, and so when my father's dad then took a turn and was going to die, he the first thing he said to my dad was, "No machines, no machines." And my dad was like, "Okay, that's it." And so that's how he died. So you you, you are a bit strapped in terms. Of you could say what is possible, but. To, to the best of your ability, make it clear so family know. You know what I mean? And, it's, and remember too, even if you do not resuscitate order, you can change that. I talked to one guy one time, he was like, you know, I was really into do not resuscitate me in my 40s. Now that I'm like 65, I'm looking towards 70, I'm a little more, uh, I'm not as committed to it now. I think like, <laughs> you know, maybe I could be resuscitated, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. So these things, you, they can change. And I think that's what's key, yeah. But they're good questions, yeah. Yes, Hi, um, just a couple of things um, I wondered about what you said. Um, first of all, are these groups um, talking about an extension of life um, en masse, um, just in terms of resources um, yeah. of the planet, and also, um, well, you know, population? Yeah. Um, I wondered yeah. what the, yeah. um, you know, had they thought that sort of thing through. Yeah. Um, the second thing as well is, see, I'm a bit nervous you know, please, talking please, please, everyone, please. but um, when you mentioned um, consciousness, mm -hmm. um, to me, I thought that once the body has physically gone, mm -hmm. um, 
it's gone. So I know it's like a simple analogy, but if you've got, you know, a, even a remote which has a battery in it, right. it doesn't matter if the if the remote's um, gone. It doesn't matter that um, the batteries are still working. It doesn't mean right. The remote doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Once yeah. the remote's broken, it's broken. Right. You can transfer the batteries, right. but you know it doesn't mean the remote's you know right is is um, usable anymore. So I just wanted. To, yeah, you know, what you, yeah, that's a good like. So, yeah. so I'll do. For, I'll actually I'll go for your second question, and I'll go to your first question because your first one's a really good one. Both really good questions. Um, second one in terms of body. So this goes back to the gentleman's question right here. So say you're able to upload consciousness, but but we really we do think of our we think of our conscious we think of our identity ourselves as being embodied. Like we think of ourselves as having a body in some fashion or form, even if it's a virtual body. Right, we've all going to have friends now that we we are friends with on, say, Facebook that we've never met, like like so it's a virtual kind of friendship. But nonetheless, we know there's a kind of embodied existence behind it. What happens if what you're talking about is a kind of consciousness or an existence or a person that has no physical body, and there and then if you transfer this consciousness, where do you put that consciousness into a new body? Was well, that a donor body? Like where are you getting this body from? Right, or is it a, a manufactured body? Is it some? Is it like a robot machine? I mean, what? And this this spins in lots of different directions. So that is a big, both um, f uh, not just philosophical but medical debate and conundrum, which is where does the consciousness go? Because we really perceive ourselves as having this physical embodiment. Right? We, if you say who am I, you think of the person generally in that kind of embodied form. And so th there's that. I'm not saying humans can't get past that. We could, we could do all kinds of things. But that is one conundrum. Question one, which is a great question, who gets access to this radical life extension biotechnology? That is largely um, swept under the rug. The easiest thing to say is like, well, everybody will. But we know that's not true. I mean, come on. <laughs> like, that's not true. Number two, the biggest pushers of this right now, and I didn't mention this before, I should with Google, are Silicon Valley uh, tech billionaires. So it is, it is not, I think, it's not a coincidence that you have a group of, and I, I'm perhaps being unfair to my sort of my socio-demographic, but it is um, white men with billions who somehow or other want to preserve their genius for the future of humanity, right? And, and it really does, and this has been studied in a couple of different ways, this whole concept of radical life extension really does skew along gender lines. So it really is something you will find men are much more interested in pursuing than women. Now, I'm not, I don't ever want to essentialize gender and say women can't be interested in this. It's just that in a number of studies, what they found in looking at it in conversations, ethnographic work, that men seem much more intrigued with this idea of living forever, and women don't think they're like, well, why would I want to live forever? You know what I mean? Like that. The, and so there have been really interesting conflicts within marriages about this, where the husband is going to be cryopreserved at Alcor, and the wife thinks it's a terrible idea, but has the legal responsibility if the husband dies to make sure that it occurs. You know what I mean? And so they get all these, like, that's a classic American situation, probably. But the answer to your question is, no, of course it wouldn't be mass. And, and the thing is, then, are we just going to see, as I was talking about before, life age differences, are we just going to see those, those like, disparities increase exponentially? And, and, and as things are right now, I think we, there's no reason that wouldn't I don't see a reason that, that wouldn't happen. And I'm not, I'm not a pessimistic person. It just doesn't seem like there would be that kind of access. Yeah, and, that, and that's a key issue, I think. Are there any more questions? Um, you were talking about um, either extending or prolonging the aging process. Would that work as in uh, the aging process would be prolonged as in the rubber band? Would you be a baby for 50 years and then yeah. carry on? Or is there a yeah. certain age where you stop aging? And be that age for another couple of hundred years. Um, that's so the speculative argument that about. Okay, so j just think about like the average. Think about your your. Think about what we just describe as like personal development. If you start to alter lifespan in such a way, um, you know, what if your adolescence is like a hundred years? 
you know, if you're like a teenager for a hundred years, you know, something like that, you know, that kind of thing. And so there is one of those questions, like, do we just want to radically extend the entire development of life so that you're an infant for like 50? Now, right now we can't do that. Like that's not, and you can make the case that if you, even if you're going to take the speculative tack on all of this, that it's going to be easier, speculatively speaking, to get to a certain age and then try and stop that aging. Um, so say 30, 20, 30, 40, whatever that might be. But then, yeah, the question would be, then how long are you that age? And then how do you die? So one scenario is, well, there's the assisted dying one, or another scenario is you are programmed in such a way that once you hit that age, 300, 400, you have a rapid decline. So it's like a button gets hit, boom, and you're like, no, no, I don't know, like you just decompose in front of people. No, but I mean, like you have, like you suddenly, you just suddenly age and die, or you just die, whatever it might be. But those are all the scenarios we don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I say this to my university students, my undergrads, I'm like, what if you're in college for 20 years? How does that sound? <laughs> you know what I mean? You might as well be a grad student at that point. But I mean, like, you know, you get this idea of like, what if, what if everything we think about is being the normal life course is just decades longer? You know, how long do you have to take care of your children? Because 18 might not mean anything anymore. Right? What if you're a parent for like 200 years? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that, like, how long are you paying those bills? I'll give you another even bigger example. I had a, I had a student one time, great, um, a student raised a great point in class, and she said, how would we handle pensions in a pension system? And, like, what's the payout on a 200-year pension? You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So there are real issues. This comes back to the Silicon Valley point. I, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's a number of very affluent, super wealthy individuals who just are not thinking about money because they don't have to. Like they're, they're gonna, they will die before they spend near a fraction of their billions. So actually one of the running jokes is why do all the Silicon Valley dudes want radical life extensions so they can live long enough to spend all their money? You know, like you need a 300 or 500 year lifespan to even get close to spending three billion. You know what I mean? Oh, it's a terrible problem to have, that kind of stuff. No. We can take more questions. I don't know, I know we're time, but we can take more questions. It's up to you. Yeah, it's up to you. I'll take it. We're going to be looked after by robots. The question was, are we going to be looked after by robots? That's one scenario. How do we deal with an aging population that way? We're going to have robot caretakers. Japan's already doing that. So the Danes, actually, in, in the Netherlands. Yeah, man, please go ahead. Well, this will be the last question. I'll let everybody out of here because you've, you've been a good. Good eyes, what right. about fertility? Because if you live up to 300 and say you're a woman and then you go through yeah. menopause or something, yeah. how, 50, what happens? Yeah, how long is the reproductive cycle? The Bush, uh, the Bush Bioethics Committee raised this point. They actually did it in the most Bush administration-y kind of way, which is they said, <laughs> so when you read this, you're like, wow. Um, one of their concerns, one of their cultural political concerns about radical life extension is that women might choose to stop having children. Because, like, what, what would it do to the family if suddenly people were, if women were living for so much longer, they might say, I don't need to do these things anymore, right? And I was like, wow, really, guys? Like, that's the best you came up with, like, in that kind of way? Um, but no, really, like, fertility, menopause, um, but the same thing for men. Like, you know, sperm have a shelf life. It's not like in the older, it's been, it's been studied more and more now, the older men are, the, the greater the likelihood that their sperm can contribute to developmental problems. Um, past a certain age. So you have to figure out sort of in a, in a very real sense reproductively what does that mean? Because then we come back to this point of, okay, so fine, say we stick with the normal, normal as is reproductive cycle we've got now, fine, but that still means you've got people who are living for several hundred years. So you do everything like we've got now, you gotta have children or whatever it might be, you wanna have families in their 30s and 40s and 50s, and then that all stays the same, but then boom, people are off you know, living and running. Or in the case of, let's say, menopause, right, say that is just extended. And for all the women I've known who've gone through that, I've talked to, especially my mom, they think that's a bad idea, right? You know, like the whole, like, extension of that stuff, too. So, yeah, yeah, it's great. All right, we'll leave it at that, because I want to give a chance to get out of here, so. Brilliant, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. It was great. Good question. Thank you.